Hello. Yeah. So good morning, everyone. So welcome to the morning session of our um, <clears throat> workshop program. And uh, in this morning, we have three talks. And uh, the first talk is given by uh, Ernst Berg. And he's telling us uh, uh, about the Wiesman Franz law um, in strange metal. Okay. So let's welcome. Okay, right. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to the uh, organizers uh, for uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, to speak here. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk about the uh, Wiedemann Franz law and its uh, application to uh, strange metals. And uh, uh, these are the, the um, uh, collaborators on the works that I'm going to mention, and I'll highlight them as I as I go along. Some some of them are here. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, this is my uh, outline. So I, I'm gonna uh, start from basically the, the most conventional strange metal you can find. Uh, that's a, a, that's a, a, a metal tuned to the vicinity of a Van Hoof singularity, just as a test case. And uh, it turns out that just, just from that, you can actually learn something interesting about the Wiedemann Franz law. Um, it, it actually is predicted to break down in an interesting way close to a Van Hoof singularity. Uh, and then I'll move on to uh, uh, to uh, more exotic cases, uh, strange metals like uh, marginal Fermi liquids, and I'll discuss what the uh, yeah. And I think it's recording. The, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, and I'll uh, I'll uh, discuss what the Wiedemann Franz law can actually tell us about the mechanism of uh, of uh, uh, strange metals a little bit more more broadly. All right, so. Uh, I'll start with this example of tuning a metal to the vicinity of, of uh, Van Hove singularity. It's a relatively conventional case, but uh, beautifully, it was actually realized recently in uh, a, a Sarnstrom Ruthen H214. It's a very, very clean metal, so it's a very good test case. And uh, it, what's been done is actually applying uniaxial strain to the system so that that, that can tune a, one of the three bands in the system through the uh, a, a Van Hoff singularity. This is a very quasi 2D metal. So you can really think about the 2D band structure. And uh, you see that this, uh, this band as a function of strain actually uh, reaches, uh, touches the, uh, a, the uh, zone edge. Okay, and uh, this is a, a plot of the uh, logarithmic derivative of the uh, resistivity as a, a, as a function of temperature and as a function of strain. Okay, so uh, here's zero strain. This is uh, a, where the Van Hoff singularity is. That's actually been confirmed by ARPIS measurements as well. A, and this is temperature. Okay, so you see this beautiful fan-shaped a, 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 a behavior. So it really looks like a quantum critical point. It is a quantum critical point, but presumably a very trivial one. It's just, it's just the uh, a Van Hoff singularity. And uh, what you see here very clearly, okay, so if you look at the exponent of the resistivity as a function of temperature, it's, uh, it's close to T squared on either side of the Van Hoff singularity, but close to the a, 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 a Van Hoff singularity and in this quantum critical region, it actually deviates and it looks like uh, somewhere close to 1.5. Okay, and this is the actual uh, a resistivity as a function of temperature. Okay, the, the, the black one is, is just shifted. Okay, the, the, this one is the actual data, uh, uh, right at the Van Hoof strain. So this is a, a, as a function of temperature at the uh, a Van Hoof strain. And uh, a, in this paper, they actually try to fit it either to t to the power one half or to t squared log t. And it turns out uh, over this range of temperature, okay, from, uh, from Tc, which is, uh, which is enhanced in this uh, close to the Van Hoof singularity, three Kelvin up to 40 Kelvin, it actually fits more or less equally well both, both forms. Um, there's a more recent experiment actually by the same group, by, by uh, uh, Clifford Hicks and company, where they uh, uh, suppress superconductivity by a field, and uh, they actually find that T squared log T actually uh, uh, fits the data visibly better than, than uh, uh, T to the power 1.5. Okay, so where is this actually coming from? And uh, if you think about it a little bit, this is actually somewhat surprising. So uh, think about it in the following way. Okay, so the only change from uh, zero strain to the Van Hove strain is that uh, there's this small area of the Fermi surface in one of the bands 
that's going through the Vanova singularity. So in that part of the Fermi surface, the Fermi velocity is going through zero. But other parts of the Fermi surface are actually not affected by much, at least in terms of the band structure. So it's somewhat surprising that the transport, which presumably would be short-circuited by the parts of the Fermi surface that undergo the, the smallest scattering rate, is actually affected at all by this, uh, by this uh, a minute change in the Fermi surface. Okay, so uh, the question is, why isn't there no short circuiting of, uh, of the Van Hoff singularity by all the parts of the Fermi surface that are, that are far away? Yeah. So, so you know, I mean, it's, uh, um, uh, I think that it is elastic, but for this purpose, yeah, I mean, there, there's no plastic, uh, Effects. The, the uh, residual re resistivity is actually not affected much. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah. So the, the question is, uh, you, you can uh, imagine it in this way: the uh, parts of the Fermi surface that are undergoing the Vanov singularity are somehow becoming uh, becoming hot. Okay. There's a very high density of states there, but uh, uh, why? Uh, so maybe there's an a, a enhanced uh, a scattering there also. But why aren't they uh, short-circuited by all the, all the rest of the Fermi surface that actually, that, which is actually not undergoing any dramatic change? Okay, and to answer that, you have to think about different scattering processes. So uh, here's the system where one of the bands is tuned into the uh, Vanov singularity. And uh, um, we can it's useful actually to classify the different scattering processes into these different groups. Okay, so uh, we'll distinguish the cold electrons, which are which live far away from the Vanov singularity, and the hot, quote, hot electrons, which are living in the, in the vicinity of the Vanov singularity. This would be a cold, cold to cold, cold a scattering process, a process of two a, of two electrons. Okay, this would be classified as a cold, cold to cold, hot scattering process. Okay, so we start from two electrons, which are far away from the Vanov singularity. One of them is scattered uh, somewhere over here, and the other one is scattered into the Vanov singularity, essentially. Okay, so that's another type of scattering process. And uh, thirdly, we can have uh, a cold hot to cold hot. So we have uh, we start from a, an electron far away and a, an electron at the Vanov singularity, and uh, a, they scatter by small momentum, a, such that the uh, a, the hot one a, remains hot and the cold one a, 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 remains cold. Okay, now we can ask about the contribution of these different scattering processes to uh, a transport. Okay, so uh, a, the cold cold to cold cold um, doesn't know about the Vanov singularity. So we expect this to have the usual Fermi liquid type scattering, a, a, a scattering rate of T squared. Okay, this cold cold to cold hot process picks up a, the logarithmic singularity of the density of states from the vicinity of the Vanov singularity. And two other important points to note. This process involves a large momentum transfer. Okay, it actually might as well be an umklap process. So, so it does show up in the electrical resistivity. And moreover, it turns out that uh, in the presence of, uh, of multiple bands, this process can actually occur anywhere on the Fermi surface. It's not limited to any particular uh, portion of the Fermi surface. So it's not short-circuited. Uh, short the scattering rate from this process, if it's large, would actually appear anywhere on the Fermi surface. So it, it will appear in the resistivity. And finally, there's this cold hot to cold hot process, uh, which can occur anywhere on the Fermi surface, but always involves a very small momentum transfer because the hot electron has to remain hot. Okay, so uh, this would show up uh, very strongly in the single particle scattering rate, but would not contribute much to the electrical transport because it involves a, a very small momentum transfer. Okay, so. Uh, from the cold cold to cold hot uh, uh, scattering rate, you actually uh, get this t squared log t behavior. Okay, uh, uh, in this paper with Sean and Connie from a couple of years ago, uh, we actually applied the same mechanism to a slightly more exotic uh, 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 behavior. Okay, in the 327, the bilayer strontium rutinate material. Uh, apparently, there's a stronger Van Hove singularity than this. This is just the ordinary uh, logarithmic Van Hove singularity. And we invoked that uh, to, to get to the, beha the behavior which is observed there, which is actually linear in T resistivity in a specific T that uh, it diverges like T log T. Okay, and possibly that can explain that material. Okay, but I think that here things are much clearer and uh, we believe that this is actually the right mechanism. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Um, 
Uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, you know, one, one thing you can do is scatter right from here to here, right, so uh, hot to hot, but that's a very particular momentum, so uh, that, that won't, uh, won't allow you to scatter cold electrons from anywhere to anywhere on the Fermi surface, okay, so that, uh, that again, was not expected to show up in transfer. Okay, any other questions? What's that? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so uh, um, the uh, quote marginal Fermi liquid applies to the three, three to seven, not to this material. Okay, so there it looks like, okay, the, the, uh, the resistivity there uh, in a special value of the magnetic field scales like T, and the specific heat is T log T. So that's, that's a behavior which we associate with a marginal Fermi liquid, okay, where the uh, self energy goes like omega log omega. But, but this is not here. I'll, I'll actually discuss that later. But in, in this situation, what you get is not a marginal Fermi liquid. Okay, it deviates from the usual Fermi liquid behavior, but it's not the marginal Fermi liquid. All right, uh, yeah, any other questions, comments? Okay. So, uh, yeah, so, so now the question is, well, there is this, uh, uh, these uh, cold hot to cold hot processes that are actually much more singular than the uh, cold, cold to cold hot processes. And the question is, where do they show up? So this is small momentum transfer. They don't show up in the electrical resistivity, but uh, these are inelastic scattering processes. You might expect them to show up in the, elect in the thermal connectivity. Okay, and that's, that's what we actually uh, eh, decided to look at. So just as a brief uh, reminder, the uh, eh, eh, wiedemann franz law is, is uh, is uh, a relation between the electrical and the thermal connectivity that was actually observed empirically very long ago uh, that appears in metals. And it's basically the following statement. Okay, so you define the Lorentz ratio, which is the ratio of the thermal connectivity uh, over temperature uh, times the electrical connectivity. And it turns out in a very, uh, that in a very broad uh, um, variety of metals uh, at, at, at low temperature, this ratio actually approaches a universal value. Okay, so it's uh, it's pi squared over three times uh, a, a k Boltzmann over e to the power of two. Okay, and uh, a, here are some examples. Okay, so uh, the open squares here are nickel. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a quasi one dimensional metal. This is the Lorentz ratio divided by L naught as a function of temperature. And you see this uh, nice approach to one. Okay, this is uh, a, this is silver. Okay, so so again, at the lowest temperatures, it uh, approaches one, and here's even a a, a a heavy fermion compound. Okay, you see this very typical behavior of uh, it starts from one at very at the lowest temperatures, it deviates down, and it actually recovers back to one at higher temperatures. But uh, here, I'll mostly focus on the on the uh, on the low temperature bit. Okay, and uh, what's kind of striking is that in these different materials, this, this ratio really approaches one within a few percent. So it's really a quantitative, a, a quantitative prediction. Okay, and what's, what's the origin of, this, um, of the, of the Wittemann-Franz law? It's basically elastic scattering, okay? So uh, it comes very naturally out of the, of the Boltzmann equation when the scattering is elastic. And the argument is very, very simple. Okay, so the idea is that uh, at low temperature, both uh, the, the thermal connectivity and the electrical connectivity are both ca um, basically carried by electronic quasi-particles. And uh, to get a resistivity of any kind, you need to relax either the, the electrical or the thermal current. Okay, so here's the expression for the electrical current in terms of the quasi-particles, and here's the thermal current. Now, if the scattering is elastic, it cannot modify the energy of the quasi-particle. It can only modify the velocity, okay? And you see that uh, a, a, to relax the electrical or the thermal current, you have to relax V of K, okay? You, you, you cannot relax uh, the energy. And therefore, it's exactly the same scattering processes that uh, contribute in the same way to both a, a, a electrical and, uh, and thermal resistivity. And this is actually the origin of this law. Okay, so uh, the explanation of this behavior uh, Okay, of the of the Lorentz ratio is that uh, at the lowest temperatures the scattering is elastic. Okay, it's dominated by impurity scattering. Then at, at higher temperatures phonons kick in and they cause inelastic scattering. This is why it deviates down. But uh, as as you as you raise the temperature, uh, uh, as soon as the temperature 
exceeds some typical uh, frequency of the phonons, the scattering from phonons becomes quasi elastic again. Okay, so the, uh, the phonons can only absorb uh, energy of order of their frequency. And uh, uh, when the energy of the, of the electrons becomes higher, when the temperature is higher than that, then uh, the scattering from phonons is essentially elastic. Okay, this is why uh, the Lawrence, the, the uh, Wiedemann Franz law actually recovers at high, at high temperatures again. Okay, this is a very, very typical behavior in many metals. Okay, so coming back, yes. Yeah. Uh, no. So uh, yeah. So what what happens here is that uh, uh, this is a this is a heavy fermion compound. Okay. And uh, uh, at high temperature, you have quasi elastic scattering from from the um, local magnetic moments. And this is the reason for this recovery. Okay. So it's actually quite different physics, but uh, yeah, it's not phonons here. All right. Okay, so uh, coming back to the example of a metal tuned close to a Vanov singularity. Okay, so what's uh, expected to happen there? So uh, we saw that there are these CH to CH scattering processes that are that involve a, a very small momentum transfer and don't show up in the electrical resistivity, but these are inelastic scattering. Okay, so they can relax the quasi particle energy, and therefore we expect them to show up actually very strongly in the thermal resistivity. Okay, and this might lead to a very strong violation of the Wiedemann Franz law. So uh, uh, we calculate the uh, 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 the cold electron cross section to scatter off hot electrons. Okay, which is described in the diagram, and that uh, turns out to scale like the like t to the power of three halves. Okay, so very very different from the uh, usual Fermi liquid behavior, uh, which is t, which is uh, t squared. Okay, and uh, if you if you calculate the uh, thermal conductivity the, uh, kappa over t, that's a, that actually scales like one over t to the power of three halves. Okay, so it is actually dominated by these processes, and uh, you compare that to the electrical conductivity that goes like one over t squared log t. So uh, the ratio, which is the uh, a Lorentz ratio, actually scales like square root of t times log t. Okay, so uh, as a function of temperature, this is what happens. The red curve here is when our system is exactly at the uh, Van Hoff singularity. Okay, so uh, you, uh, there's this uh, precipitable, uh, uh, this very, very dramatic drop of the Lorentz ratio basically to zero. And then if we tune away from the uh, Van Hoff singularity, this is what we expect. Okay, so uh, uh, by the way, this is a perfectly clean, uh, uh, so uh, the calculation is for a perfectly clean system. We'll discuss what happens in the presence of impurities shortly. Okay, but uh, in the clean limit, this is what we expect uh, to find. This is this very, very dramatic violation of the Wiedemann Franz law. Okay, and uh, a, a similar effects were actually predicted in a variety of situations where uh, there's a source of very strong inelastic scattering that involves a small momentum transfer. Okay, so some, some examples are just an ordinary 2D Fermi liquid. There's also a, a expected to be a violation of uh, Wiedemann Franz uh, law, but only uh, a logarithmic. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, and uh, some other examples are a, a, a hydrodynamic metals a, or metals close to specific quantum critical points. Okay, these all are expected to have similar violations of the uh, Wiedemann Franz law. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, 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 it comes from this, okay? So, so uh, if you just calculate the, um, the spectrum of charge fluctuations close to a Van Hove singularity, okay? So, so that turns out to have a stronger singularity than log, okay? So, so, uh, so, so uh, yeah, so, so, so this is coming from Q, uh, 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 Q smaller than, uh, Sorry, Q bigger than omega um, over a small range close to the uh, Van Hoff singularity. This is where this uh, this uh, this uh, singular behavior is is uh, coming from. Yeah. Ah. Uh, uh, given the high density of states in the Van Hoff singularity, why don't uh, we also consider the Hot, hot, and cold, cold scattering process. Right. So, so uh, um, the question is why? Why not consider a hot, hot to hot, hot scattering process? That's because most of the electrical and the thermal current is carried by the cold electrons. Okay. So, 
this would occur. This is what, what you might measure if you measured the, the uh, single particle lifetime of, of the hot electrons. But uh, we're, we're interested here in the uh, transport properties. Okay, so it's really mostly the uh, cold electrons. Okay, so, uh, right, so, um, okay, so, so we see that the Lorentz ratio actually carries some interesting uh, information about the, the uh, uh, scattering processes in the system, the inelastic scattering processes in, in particular. And now we'd like to apply that to uh, understand the mechanisms of strange metals more, more broadly. Okay, and uh, here's just one example of that. Uh, so uh, this is a recent example from Andy McKenzie's group. So this is uh, a, a palladium chromate material. And uh, that over some range of temperatures shows uh, a, uh, a very nice linear in T uh, a, a resistivity. And uh, a, from comparing that to a sister compound, palladium cobaltate, a, a, they argued that this linear in T it may not be due to phonons. That's the usual mechanism to get linear and T resistivity at high temperature. And the reason is that uh, a palladium chrome, a, a cobaltate actually has a identical structure, okay? And is, is very similar, have very, very similar a phonon spectrum. And uh, the only difference between these two materials is that uh, the chromate actually has lo a, a localized magnetic moments on the chromium ions and the cobaltate doesn't, okay? And uh, you see this big difference in the resistivity and also the, res the resistivity in the cobaltate is not quite linear. But it turns out that if you look at the Lorentz ratio uh, in the chromate material, in the region where the resistivity is linear, that actually approaches one within a few percent. Okay, so this is a very strong hint that uh, the source of this linear interior resistivity is coming from elastic scattering processes from some uh, a slow degree of freedom, presumably the phonons nevertheless. And of course, there are some puzzles. Okay, uh, uh, okay. So why wh why the big difference between the cobaltate and the chromate materials? Also, uh, the slope of the scattering rate as a function of temperature here turns out to be close to the so-called Planckian limit. Okay, it's h bar uh, over kBT. Uh, and the question is, why is that? Uh, okay, so these puzzles uh, I think are uh, are still open. Okay, so this is just an example of how, how you can learn about the mechanism of the strange metal, okay, for, from, from the Lorentz ratio. If it's one, it's a strong hint that uh, it's all elastic scattering. Okay, but now we get to the main puzzle. Okay, so we'll, we, yeah. Yes, yeah, so in, in um, right, so the, the Lorentz ratio is, 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 is kappa over T sigma. So if kappa for some reason is much bigger, it can go above one. For instance, in an insulator, it could go infinitely above one because uh, sigma goes to zero and kappa is carried by phonons. Okay. Yeah, so in, in metals, usually what happens is that uh, even at, at quite elevated temperatures, the electrons are, are dominating both, the, uh, both kappa and sigma. And that's because the Fermi velocity is so much bigger than the, uh, the phonon velocity, the uh, speed of sound. Okay, and then typically what you, what you find is that it's either below one or one. What? Yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah, right, right. So yeah, so uh, there, there are various reasons for that. Uh, the electrons are not so fast. Um, they're probably strongly coupled with phonons, but uh, yeah. Okay, but now let's, let's get to the group rates. Okay, so now we get to the, maybe the strangest of the strange of the metals. Okay, and uh, here's uh, a particular group rate. This is a uh, neodymium doped LSCO. Uh, and uh, uh, close to the so-called critical doping, the resistivity is actually linear on one hand down to extremely low temperature, and on the other hand, uh, up to quite high temperature. This is a, a clearly a, a violation of what we expect from a Fermi liquid. Uh, moreover, at this uh, value of the doping, the specific heat actually has a, a logarithmic uh, a, a singularity. It goes like uh, T log T. And uh, the question is, what can we learn from the wiedemann franz ratio on, on, this, uh, on this behavior? It turns out that uh, at, at the lowest temperatures measured, surprisingly, the wiedemann franz law is actually obeyed uh, within a few percent in this uh, system. And most strikingly, even in this magic doping, this uh, critical doping when the uh, resistance is, is linear down to the lowest temperature, the Wiedemann-Franz is actually obeyed. 
Okay, it's also obeyed for the transfers, uh, transport uh, coefficient sigma x y and cap x y. Here's a different cuprate. Okay, so this is a, a thallium cuprate, also that shows linear resistivity down to the lowest temperatures over a, a, a range of doping, actually, uh, where uh, superconductivity is uh, suppressed by high field. And here the Lorentz ratio is uh, obeyed up to uh, up to one percent. Okay, so yeah. Uh, what's the uh, uh, temperature here? Here? Yeah, so, so, so this is trying to extrapolate to t equals zero. Okay, so they, they, me they measure the Lorentz ratio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, superconductivity is suppressed by high field. Okay, and 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 this is going. This is uh, trying to go to the lowest temperature because because really the the Wiedemann-Franz law should only be obeyed even in a normal metal only at zero temperature. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So that's the question. Okay. So presumably it is an impurity dominated regime. Okay. But the question is if you have a uh, some kind of non Fermi liquid, which this presumably is. Okay, so should the Wiedemann Franz law be obeyed even at zero temperature? Okay, the, the argument for a uh, normal model was all relying on the existence of essentially free quasi particles. Okay, so what, what does this tell us? Does this tell us that there are quasi particles or just that it's obeyed because of disorder? Or yeah, what does it say? Yeah, so as far as I remember, it's always obeyed within our bars. They, they, yeah, yeah. They, they, they never saw a clear, large, reproducible violation anywhere, basically, at low temperature. Okay, so what, what does that tell us? Okay, so uh, that's, that's gonna be the question for the remainder of this talk. Okay, so uh, uh, maybe uh, it tells us that actually underlying this, there is an ordinary Fermi liquid and just uh, the scatters uh, uh, are, are quasi elastic, but for some reason, the scattering rate is linear in temperature. Okay, there's some low energy degree of freedom that we didn't know about that uh, scales linearly with temperature. Okay, and uh, in particular, what we'd like to know is, uh, in, in, for instance, what's the Lorentz ratio of a marginal Fermi liquid? Okay, so suppose we have a system where Fermi liquid is just marginally violated. And uh, a, that's, a, a, that's a phenomenological model that was proposed uh, a, a while back to explain the a, a behavior of the, of the cooperates. Okay, so uh, this would be a system where the single particle self energy scales in this way. Okay, the real part has a logarithmic correction to the usual Fermi liquid behavior. Lambda here is some coupling constant and the imaginary part a, a scales like the maximum of T and omega. Okay, and this implies in particular that uh, the single particle scattering rate at zero frequency scales like temperature. And uh, in some situations, if, if this uh, scattering uh, of, of, uh, of uh, single particles is, uh, is a lar large angle scattering, umklapp, uh, umklapp scattering, uh, that also implies that the resistivity actually scales linearly uh, with temperature. Okay, and the uh, specific heat would get this logarithmic behavior. Both of these behaviors are actually seen at this magic doping in the, in the cuprates. Okay, now, uh, um, a couple of comments here. Okay, so uh, um, the marginal Fermi liquid is really a phenomenological theory. Okay, to, to, uh, to make uh, predictions, we really need some model that we can solve that gives this behavior and allows us to calculate any other quantity. For instance, we can write models that give this uh, single particle scattering, uh, scattering rate or self energy, but the uh, uh, resistivity would not scale linearly in temperature because the scattering all comes from small angle scattering. Okay, so this is actually what happens in the model that uh, Avi mentioned uh, yesterday. If you have a 3D Fermi surface coupled to a critical boson, this is, uh, this is precisely what happens. Uh, second, it's kind of interesting to note uh, that uh, um, uh, the marginal Fermi liquid has a nice property. If you look at the single particle scattering rate, that's the uh, imaginary part of the self energy divided by the derivative of the real part, the Z factor. Okay, and that's uh, from this, the coupling constant lambda, if lambda is big, it, it actually drops out. Okay, and uh, uh, this is T over log T. So it's, uh, if you like, this is a Planckian behavior. Okay, it's bounded by a KBT over H bar. It uh, never exceeds that value. So uh, um, uh, that's a uh, worth, worth noting uh, a property. 
Okay, so uh, right. And the question is, what would be the Lorentz ratio of, the, of this type of system? And for that, we'll actually need some concrete model that we can solve and gives this, this behavior. Okay, so uh, uh, to construct such a model, I'd like to make a small detour, okay, and uh, uh, just uh, describe the strategy. Okay, so uh, in general, we're interested in uh, a, some kind of uh, lattice model of ele electronic uh, degrees of freedom. So suppose we have an N-band Hubbard model, okay, and on, uh, on every site we have some number of orbitals, and uh, the type of Hamiltonian we'd like to solve is uh, a, each, each orbital has some hopping and there's some uh, interactions between different orbitals on different sites and so on. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we're interested in, uh, in uh, uh, these uh, strange metal phases that are uh, difficult to get perturbatively. We know that if we just do perturbation theory and the, the coupling will typically get a, uh, a, a, a Fermi liquid phase. Okay, and uh, in addition to that, we'd like to, uh, to include disorder, lattice defects, phonons, and so on. Okay, so these are, of course, of course, very, very hard to solve, not perturbatively in the uh, interactions. Okay, the strategy I'll take here is to imagine that the number of orbitals on every site is actually very large. Okay, so that provides us with a small parameter, one over n, which is not uh, the interaction strength. So that can potentially give us some access to, uh, to these strange metal phases. Okay, yeah. so uh, that comes, of course, with, uh, with a price. Okay, we have to introduce a symmetry, uh, or at least a statistical symmetry between these different orbitals it, in order to be able to solve it. Uh, okay, so uh, there's the worry that uh, uh, this large number of degrees of freedom on every site provides a bath uh, for dissipation. That's, uh, that's not something that, we, uh, that exists in the real system. Okay, but uh, this can, can give us access to these non-quasi-particle uh, regimes that are hard to access otherwise. Okay, so this give, give us at least some window into this, uh, these behaviors. Okay, let, let me just give you one, uh, one example that we worked on and kind of uh, relates to uh, something that uh, Nikolai uh, uh, talked about yesterday. So we, we wanted to, to study a, a scattering of electrons due to phonons close to the uh, matthieu regel limit where the mean free path of electrons becomes of order one. Okay, and uh, uh, that can be done using this uh, approach. Okay, so we, we, we introduce a model which has n uh, electronic orbitals or bands uh, on every site and has n squared uh, flavors or modes of phonons on every site. Okay, so this is our Hamiltonian. This is the electronic part. This is the uh, phonon part, and this is the uh, interaction. And as uh, Nikolai described, we considered uh, two types of uh, interactions. One of them is on site. Okay, and one of them, the phonons are actually coupled to the electron density on, on the same site. And the other one is the SSH type where the uh, uh, phonons are, are coupled to the bond density. Okay, and uh, uh, we can solve this model when the uh, electron phonon coupling is of order one or even exceeds one, uh, as long as N is big enough. And we're interested in this context in, a, in, the, in the regime where the temperature is much bigger than the, the bifrequency, but much smaller than the uh, a, a Fermi energy. Okay, and it turns out that these two models actually give a very different behavior in this case. Okay, and the Holstein type, type model, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, resistivity grows linearly with temperature. And then when you reach the matthieu ferrega limit, okay, mean free path of the electrons becomes order one. There's a kink in this uh, slope, but it just continues linearly with a different slope. Okay, so there is a crossover, but uh, there isn't the so-called resistivity saturation, which occurs in many, many real metals when, when uh, a KFL approaches one. Uh, okay, on the other hand, in the SSH type uh, uh, variant of the model, it starts linearly as well. That's the usual block uh, Runeisen behavior. But then when KFL becomes of order one times some function of the density, uh, there is a resistivity saturation to a value of the order of H over E squared. Okay, in, in, this is a 2D model. Okay, so this is the so-called uh, resistivity saturation. It's a possible explanation of that behavior, which is actually seen in many metals. And uh, in, in this particular case, we can test uh, how bad is the uh, approximation of setting n to infinity. Okay, so uh, in, the, in this temperature regime where the temperature is much bigger than the phonon frequency, we can treat the phonons as essentially static. Okay, and we can solve the problem uh, uh, numerically and calculate the uh, uh, resistivity using Monte Carlo. Okay, we can calculate the uh, resistivity for a finite n. So here's n equals the same model, n equals two four, uh, six, eight, and here's uh, infinity. Okay, so at least qualitatively, uh, the, n, the large n limit actually captures the behavior of this model, even for n as small as, as two or four. 
Okay, and there's some other other uh, predictions. I won't get into that. Okay, but now what we want is uh, basically uh, a, a controlled theory of a non-fermi liquid at low temperature, okay, where we can ask about the Lorentz ratio. And uh, a, there is a model that does that, just that. That's the a, such the Vieki type model. So that's basically a, a, a model of a quantum dot, a zero dimensional system that has n electronic a, orbitals and they're interacting all to all. Okay, so uh, there's only interaction in this model, no hopping. Okay, so uh, a, a, every four of these orbitals are interacting via this, uh, this type of term. And uh, the uh, interaction matrix element is random. We take it to, to uh, all these uh, interaction constants to be independent random variables, such that their average is zero and their variance is some uh, value u squared. Okay, and it turns out that uh, this uh, problem uh, can actually be solved in the larger limit. Okay, it gives a uh, very interesting non-fermi liquid behavior. Okay, the uh, single particle self self energy scales like, like one over square root of omega. Uh, moreover, this model uh, um, is argued to be self averaging, meaning that in the, uh, what we can compute is only the uh, uh, the configuration averaged self energy over all realizations of this uh, uh, interaction matrix. But the claim is that even a typical realization would actually show the same behavior, and that's been checked numerically. Uh, this model is also maximally chaotic, which I, which I won't talk about. Okay, so uh, the idea is to try to use this model as sort of a window into uh, non quasi particle transport. Yes. A green function, sorry. Yeah. It's... Okay. So uh, uh, to study transport, we actually need to generalize this model into a higher, higher uh, spatial dimensions. Okay, so here's a lattice, lattice uh, generalization of this model. Again, on every, uh, every uh, unit cell, we have now these n orbitals. Okay, and uh, there's hopping between the sites and there's uh, a random all-to-all -all interaction on site. Okay, and here's our Hamiltonian. There are n identical electronic bands. They, ho they all have some uh, single particle dispersion and there's a local interaction in real space that has this S a SYK form. Okay, so all the orbitals uh, within a site are interacting in this way. And uh, a, we'll, we also want impurities, okay, disorder scattering. Notice that for every realization of this uh, random interaction, if we didn't have this last term in the Hamiltonian, the problem would be exactly translationally invariant. Okay, so uh, uh, this W equals zero, that's, that's like a clean metal in every realization. Okay, it's random. We only know how to compute things averaging over these U's, but for every realization, there's actually exact translational symmetry. And then uh, we also want to introduce controlled disorder. So this is, uh, this is a, uh, a single particle potential on site, which is actually random and site dependent. So this breaks translational symmetry. Okay, so this kind of model one can actually solve in the larger limit. It shows a crossover from a Fermi liquid at low temperature to a non-Fermi liquid at a high temperature. That's not quite what we want. Okay, so this is the uh, translational symmetry. Okay, what, what we actually want is something that shows a non-Fermi liquid uh, behavior even at, even at very low temperature. And for that, you need to generalize this model a little bit. So there's a variant of this model, which is uh, analogous to a condo lattice problem. Okay, there are two types of electrons, the C electrons, whose Hamiltonian is shown here, and they're much heavier so-called F electrons that are dispersion less. They have the same kind of Hamiltonian. They also have their own local view, but they don't hop at all. And uh, there's this uh, interaction between them, which is like a density density on-site interaction between, a, a, between the C and the F electrons. It also has this uh, SYK type form. Okay, and uh, yeah, uh, okay, yeah, I mean, I'm almost done. Okay, so uh, it turns out that uh, uh, this model, this uh, condo lattice type model, actually shows a marginal Fermi liquid behavior down to uh, the lowest temperatures. Uh, okay, you can, you can solve this model exactly in the larger limit. That's equivalent to solving basically these uh, self-consistent equations for the self-energy, and then you can compute uh, connectivities. Okay, and... Um, uh, this model actually realizes exactly the type of marginal Fermi liquid uh, proposed by, uh, by Varma et al. Okay, so it has a, uh, a, 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 an electrical resistivity that scales linearly with the uh, temperature down to the lowest temperatures, an optical connectivity that goes like one over omega log squared, specific heat, which is T log T and so on. Okay, it, it even has uh, interesting Van Hove singularity, uh, 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 interesting uh, de Hasselman alpin uh, uh, oscillations that a, a, that display the uh, Fermi surface of the C electrons, but don't have the Lifshitz-Kosovich behavior. 
Okay, so what about the Lorentz ratio in this model? Okay, so we can compute the electrical resistivity, we can compute the, the thermal kind of, uh, 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 resistivity. Uh, okay, so uh, we start from the clean limit, that is uh, without the uh, single particle disorder term. So that gives us that uh, uh, the uh, electrical uh, resistivity is just linear in T. Okay, and it turns out that uh, in the clean case, the Lorentz ratio uh, as a, is temperature independent. And uh, it has a value which actually deviates from the uh, from from the uh, uh, conventional value, okay. So it's uh, some number. This number uh, it was computed in this paper, but this number is actually not universal. It depends on on details. Uh, okay, but now we want to introduce impurities. So in the disordered case, okay. So uh, 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 somewhat to our surprise, it turns out that uh, uh, at zero temperature, the Lorentz ratio actually approaches one, even though this is an this is uh, a marginal Fermi liquid. Um, in fact, there's a slight generalization of this model, which is really a non-Fermi liquid. And nevertheless, the Lorentz ratio approaches one in the limit of T go, uh, going to zero. But what uh, my student uh, Vietal noted is that if you look at the first correction uh, as a function of temperature to the Lorentz uh, ratio, it's actually linear in uh, temperature. Okay, and this might actually serve as a sharp, a sharp signature of a marginal Fermi liquid. If you, if you do the same calculation in an ordinary Fermi liquid with impurities and with electron electron scattering, uh, the first correction would be T squared. Okay. Phonons would give you even, even higher power at low temperature. Yeah. Okay, so, so this is our, our main point. Okay, this is what the Lorentz ratio of, of, uh, of a marginal Fermi liquid, at least within this model, should show. Okay, the Lorentz ratio should approach one at t goes to zero. Okay, even though it's a, it's a non Fermi liquid, but uh, if you deviate from zero temperature, the first correction is actually linear, and the scale of the variation of the Lorentz ratio is off the scale of the elastic scattering rate. Okay, and when, when the temperature is much bigger than the elastic scattering rate, it reaches some non, non universal constant value. This is what happens in this model. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this model actually satisfies Madison's rule. Yeah, yes. Square root of temperature. Uh, a good question. I need to think about that. I, I don't think so, but uh, uh, yeah, so it's a good question. I thought, yeah, let's let's chat about that later. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm basically done. Okay. So so this is this is what uh, looks like in silver. Okay. So much more more flat. So this is really the the uh, prediction here. Uh, okay. And that's that's my uh, that's my summary slide. Okay. So the Wiedemann Franz law and its violation can tell us something interesting about uh, the mechanism of uh, of ordinary and strange metals. And uh, this is what it done. It's doing in a clean uh, metal near a a, a Van Hoff singularity. And this is a disordered marginal Fermi liquid. Okay, yeah. thanks very much. Uh, for, uh, questions, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you explain uh, a little bit uh, how the disorder happened? Is between the side is among sites? Um, yeah. So done? so. Um, the model we studied is, is a model where the disorder is, the disorder is on site. It's just, um, if you like, it's a, it's a random hybridization between these different orbitals. I don't expect it to be different if we added a little bit of randomness in the hopping between the sites. Okay, but that's not what we did. Uh, can you explain intuitively why there's this minus alpha t correction in the disorder? Yeah, 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 yes. So, so uh, right. So. I can give you an intuitive, my, my intuitive understanding of that. That is based on sort of a Fermi liquid picture. So I don't know to what extent that's uh, really correct, but the idea is very, very simple. So you say um, the scattering in this model of, uh, of electrons on, near the Fermi surface is essentially uh, momentum independent, okay, and T-linear. And that's coming in both due to the thermal and to the electrical resistivity, but it's always inelastic. So these scattering processes are weighted differently for the electrical and the thermal resistivity, unlike the elastic case where they're weighted equally. Okay, so if you go to zero temperature, it's all elastic, and then the Lorentz ratio is obeyed. 
if you uh, look at the first temperature correction, you get a different correction, T linear, but different for the sigma and the kappa. And that's why if you look at the ratio, you get the linear. Yeah, about the model, uh, you had the interaction on sites to be same for each of the sites? Yeah, like so, the, yeah. But wouldn't that lead, like after the sort of averaging to some non-local interaction between different sites? Yeah, it does, yeah. So, right, if you disorder aver average, it looks like a non-local interaction, yeah. But uh, you, you can still solve it, it turns out. So, so there's an online question. Ah. Can you yeah. Yes. Uh, right. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, if all the scattering in the system uh, is elastic, uh, uh, is the uh, with Wiedemann and Franz law uh, violated? I, I've not found an example of that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. If, if there is, a, if we can construct a model where that is the case, I, I don't know of an example. Uh, uh, what is. Uh, uh, what is the uh, experimental property of a Fermi liquid and a non-Fermi liquid? Okay, so, uh, right, I mean, uh, a Fermi liquid, we know a lot of properties, right? So they're well-defined quasi-particles and that has all sorts of experimental consequences. If they're uh, umplap scattering, the resistivity is T squared, um, a specific heat is constant and so forth. A, a non-Fermi liquid is anything that's not that, okay? A metal that's not that, it's not, it's not just one thing. Uh, um, I presume that the Fermi surface of your marginal Fermi liquid is small, not, uh, not necessarily. I mean, it's, it, it could be large. Uh, it's, it's not essential, I think, to anything that I've discussed. So there's a question here. Um, okay, so, so I, I, uh, I understand that you have, okay, one minus alpha T and then presumably, you know, minus beta T squared, minus gamma T cubed, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. But then the question is about the prefactors because I'm guessing that alpha goes as one over one over w or one over w squared. Right? Uh, the prefactor itself will depend yeah, on the ratio what, what, between your disorder squared, think, and your yes, interactions, exactly, right? Exactly. And so the question really would be, what would would the next orders, which come from phonons, actually completely dominate over this uh, linear? Yeah. So, really so in a clean window. metal, you you would want to look at the relatively clean marginal firm liquid, and then the slope is very large. But it would also have to have weak electron phonon, or then it weak electron phonon would also help. Which uh, yeah may or may not be the case. Okay, so uh, I think we need to move on. Let's thank uh, Peter again. So the next speaker um, 